Everyone. And yes, my name is Mauro Morales. I work for SpectroCloud. It's a company that provides uh, um, Kubernetes uh, management. And uh, I'm very thankful to be here at All Systems Go. Uh, it's been quite a nice conference for uh, what I've seen so far. It's also very nice to be back in Berlin. I used to live here for a period of time, uh, actually not too far in Friedrichshain. So my Deutsch is not the best, but we can vielleicht uns auch so unterhalten. Um, the name of the talk is uh, For Kairos, a new dawn for secure Linux in untrusted environments. And basically what I'm going to talk is present a little bit the Kairos project and uh, our implementation of Trusted Boot. Uh, the talk will take around 30 minutes, I think, and afterwards uh, uh, there is space for questions uh, or comments if you, if you have any. Um, because it's really a community, we're trying to make it a community project, so all your feedback is uh, most valuable for us. Um, to start, uh, Kairos is 100% open source. All of our um, uh, all, all the elements of, of Kairos are public, and uh, as a matter of fact, we recently uh, joined the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as a sandbox project. So, uh, if you want to talk to us, if you are already on the CNCF Slack channel, well, uh, you can find a Kairos channel uh, specifically to talk to us, or we also are um, on, on GitHub. So let's first, let me introduce uh, Kairos. This is kind of like how we define the project. It's a Linux meta distribution for edge Kubernetes. Uh, what does that mean, right? Um, first of all, we are a special purpose operating system. So different from the traditional uh, Ubuntu or OpenSUSE or any of these uh, major distributions, we don't try to be a fit for every possible solution out there, but instead we try to focus on, on something uh, a little bit more specific. Uh, if you want to get an idea, more or less, of uh, Kairos, it's similar to all these other projects I have here, like Flatcar, like Talos, um, K3OS. To some degree, I would say uh, Kairos is kind of following up on the steps uh, of uh, where K3OS uh, left. And uh, in terms of Kubernetes, uh, yeah, like I said, our focus is uh, on having Kubernetes uh, workloads at the edge. The main distribution that we ship with Kairos is K3S, but there are community versions for other uh, Kubernetes distributions. And actually, uh, it's just one uh, element of Kairos. If you, for any reason, are not running Kubernetes or not interested in Kubernetes, we also uh, provide um, artifacts without it so that you can uh, have your traditional uh, stack without Kubernetes. We are uh, what we call a, a meta distribution. That's a bit of a, um, maybe saying a little bit too much, uh, but it's one of the goals of the project to be able to let users continue using their know-how of whichever operating system they prefer to use already, whichever Linux distribution, sorry. Uh, that means that we have versions that are based on Ubuntu, versions that are based on OpenSUSE, Fedora, uh, etc. all the ones that you see here. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot provide 100% the same uh, functionality on all of them because, uh, for example, as we will see further, um, in the case of uh, the trusted boot, we need uh, a certain version of system D to be running on the system. And, for example, some of them haven't catched up to the latest versions yet. Or um, because, uh, like in the case of uh, Alpine, systemd is simply not there. So uh, the feature of at least trusted boot is not present and uh, not coming anytime soon to uh, an Alpine solution. However, like I said, it is really part of our goal that users can use Kairos with any of these versions, uh, either because they prefer that solution or because in their uh, work they are uh, paying licenses, for example, for a SLES or, or for a um, Red Hat. And um, finally, uh, our focus is on edge. This is the special purpose part of the operating system in that we are really trying to see what are the challenges when you're running a system at the edge and try to provide solutions uh, to our users that can make that easier. So, um, 
but first of all, why the edge, right? And um, one of the reasons is that at the moment uh, we have already managed to run Linux and Kubernetes on the data centers pretty well. They provide solutions that uh, some applications are uh, running um, successfully already. And uh, we want to be able, for users to be able to do that same thing at the edge. That means that, for example, uh, at a grocery store, you can have a high availability, small cluster um, processing data. Why at the edge? Well, uh, because first of all, it can be closer to the data. It can be closer to the user, providing a faster uh, feedback. Uh, it can be also because of uh, regulations or laws. It can be because there is a, a limitation on the network or any other uh, particular reasons that make a better solution to run at the edge. And uh, I'm very happy to share that uh, Kairos is actually uh, successfully running already uh, on some of uh, these examples. Uh, one of them is uh, dental clinics, where um, globally uh, this uh, user has um, locations all ar around the globe. And uh, for uh, one example is uh, um, government regulations. They cannot just have all the information in one data center in one country. And for them, the solution is better to have uh, all the data of the user, in this case uh, images that get uh, taken from patients, uh, specifically just in the um, dental clinic. Uh, another example is uh, farms where um, um, robots are picking up uh, fruits and uh, they happen to reduce the amount of uh, uh, fruit that gets thrown away thanks to their um, AI algorithms to determine whether uh, certain fruit is ready to be uh, picked up. And in this case, for example, uh, it's um, very important for them that their intellectual property remains safe. Uh, and another, or maybe the most common example that we have and that we're very happy to share is home labs, where uh, a lot of the users are automating their homes or simply running whatever they want to run there. Now, obviously, running at the edge is, uh, comes with extra challenges. Why? Because you don't have the um, ability to keep locked your systems behind the walls and a security guard like you can do in a data center, right? Uh, you probably are more than aware about this. There are a lot of problems that I'm not going to be touching in this case because uh, it's really a lot. Uh, even in security, there are many uh, items to, that, that we could be talking about. I am only going to focus on one, which is the booting of the OS. Uh, as you probably can imagine, if someone has physical access to the machine, then uh, through, I don't know, a USB port or uh, whatever, they can uh, try to uh, perform some sort of attack and um, try to run an unauthorized system. And uh, when I'm talking about booting unauthorized systems, uh, there are maybe two major examples that I want to refer to. One is that they might put a completely different OS there where they might want to uh, steal information that you have in that machine. Um, in, in this case, we can uh, try to solve the problem by encryption. Uh, in a worst case scenario, the machine was uh, in a good case scenario, I guess, <laughs> the machine was stolen and you lost the machine, but your data stayed safe. Um, or in a worst case scenario, uh, they put a modified OS that is uh, only so slightly different than the uh, one that you're running, so that it runs undetected on the system and, I don't know, it steals uh, information or changes data uh, according to uh, their, their interests, which would be um, affecting you, right? So um, keep in mind that uh, this solution is trying to focus on the middle part of this image. So it's not about the mechanism that is already implemented to boot uh, edge um, 
on the edge host is not about the part once the system has already been booted and your application starts. Uh, in this case, I put Kubernetes, but it can be any other application. It focuses really on the loading of the operating system. And uh, we don't really create uh, this solution uh, from scratch. Instead, uh, we're basing it out of uh, the um, architecture that uh, Leonard Potterin is uh, um, suggesting in his uh, blog post, Brave New Trusted Boot. Uh, I'm just wondering, have any of you read this uh, blog post? Maybe raise hands. Nice. Uh, for the ones that don't, here's a link uh, where, where you can get more information. I would uh, strongly suggest to read it because he makes a much better work than me explaining about the issues and uh, about um, the solution uh, overall and also how Systemd is uh, providing tools to uh, fulfill this, uh, this project. And basically what we're doing is just following uh, those guidelines. So we see Kairos Trusted Boot. Uh, first of all, the goals that uh, Kairos has is to prevent modifications to the system, like what we were uh, discussing before, not only um, at runtime, but also offline. Uh, pre prevent uh, theft of the customer data, and finally, as much as possible, keep a simple UX, which of course can be a bit challenging when uh, you have to deal with uh, um, encryption, with the keys, and, and all of that. And uh, hopefully, if we do that, our little um, mascot here uh, remains uh, secure and happy. Um, and so, uh, as I was mentioning, we basically just follow uh, this recipe that has been uh, described, where uh, we will use a bootstrap image, we will use secure boot, TPM measurements, and encrypted disks using the TPM chip as well. Uh, let's dive into uh, these different ones. First of all, uh, in case you're not aware of it, um, I, I will try to describe what Unified Kernel Images is. Basically, just an EFI file that is loaded to the firmware. And very important here to note is the fact that it can be measured entirely. So you can be sure that if something changed on the UKI, you can uh, simply stop the, uh, booting that, that um, operating system. And of course, that they, you can trust that they have been signed by your keys, so you, you have the authority of it. Uh, and on the left uh, image, you can see uh, more or less a traditional, um, uh, a traditional, sorry, a traditional Linux uh, live CD, uh, which has all these different directories. In this case, it's from OpenSUSE, but it can be from uh, similar on all the major distributions. And uh, you, you can see all the contents of it. Uh, on, to compare it, in the UKI installation of Kairos, you will only find uh, these, two, uh, these two files. One of them, uh, the biggest one being the FE boot image. And uh, that's basically the entire system. And what's inside that uh, image are the artifacts that I am listing here. The bootloader, the systemd boot uh, configuration, so that you can see the different booting menus, and uh, your keys. And finally, the Kairos uh, FE, which would be the full system in this case. Now, uh, on top, or a bit different than um, UKIs are unified system images. And this is basically the UKI with a, a major uh, change in that instead of doing the traditional process of booting from a um, Linux uh, machine, it, it doesn't take uh, a pivot from the initRD to a root file system. Instead, what we do here is kind of like a fake uh, pivot, we call it, where uh, as soon as initRD gets uh, initiated, instead of uh, pivoting, it will basically just do the changes it needs to do to the initRD itself and continue booting from there. Now, wh why this uh, is important is because if you do the pivot route, uh, you unfortunately cannot measure the root FS, at least uh, to my understanding in, in, this, um, in, the, in this implementation of the um, 
uh, trusted boot, you wouldn't be able to do to check the measurements. If you can't check the measurements, that means that you would lose immutability because something could have changed, right? And you would end up uh, not being able to ensure that the system is uh, tamper-proof. Um, contrary, with the single bootstrap image, uh, you can do that. Uh, another part of the recipe is secure boot. Uh, I'm not going to talk in depth uh, here because it's something that has already been battle tested. All I'm going to say is that we, uh, you, you can configure your uh, secure boot so that it only boots your trusted USI images. Uh, We've heard a lot uh, about uh, trusted module platforms today, so also not going to go uh, deep into it, but important here is that it's part of the solution. If the machine doesn't implement a trusted model platform uh, chip, then it's not possible to have our uh, trusted boot solution, um, which is the case, for example, on our Raspberry Pi. Um, so we're focusing mainly at the moment on uh, AMD uh, devices. And to give an example of how this process of TPM-based measurements works, uh, think of it as uh, when you're going through uh, immigration and, and uh, an officer goes, takes your passport, uh, reads some information there, looks at your image, and validates if you are really the person that says to be there, uh, the passport being uh, an authorized uh, um, paper that uh, a trusted uh, government has given, right? It's kind of a similar uh, situation where uh, the TPM chip is validating all the measurements from the different artifacts, and if all of them match, then it allows to uh, proceed with the booting. In the case of Kairos, which are the measured artifacts that we're talking about? First of all, is the kernel. So uh, despite the, the system being immutable, if by any means uh, the attacker could put a different kernel, then it wouldn't boot because, again, the measurements will match. Uh, if uh, the attacker would try to uh, produce a, to regenerate the init RAM FS, again, uh, measurements wouldn't match. Um, if the Etsy OS release file uh, would change by, uh, again, uh, slightly. So uh, even if it is uh, the same um, OS, but a different version of it, it wouldn't match. Um, and finally, the CMD line, where, I don't know, you could try to pass a different uh, stanza to boot uh, the system, uh, just, again, by a space or a minimum change, would fail to validate the measurements and it wouldn't boot. The final um, item of the uh, recipe is encryption. Uh, I mention it because uh, Kairos focuses on encryption of what we think is the most important uh, in this case, which is the user data. Why? Because the rest of the system is really the traditional uh, distributions that are out there. Uh, everything else will be already accessible uh, via the upstream channels, right? So there's nothing important from the rest of the operating system there. So that part uh, remains uh, clearly visible. But uh, the user data using the um, TPM chip is also encrypted. And if by any chance which, which means that by any chance someone were to remove the uh, disk from the machine, they wouldn't be able to unencrypt it in a different machine. Now, to give a little bit of an idea how the process runs, uh, you have the uh, firmware that uh, looks at the boot partition. There it finds the systemd bootloader, uh, which then uh, looks at one of the three images. So Kairos provides uh, always three images, the active image, the passive image, and the recovery. We will see a little bit later uh, more about that. Uh, the, fir the first um, booting, like traditionally, is the kernel. Then um, it switches into the init RD, uh, which in, the, in this case, like I was mentioning, we don't do any pivot, so it's the final image, so to speak. And then, once uh, this has been successful, uh, it proceeds to unencrypt and mount the user data, so that finally you have your functional um, operating system. 
Um, in terms of the user journey, how does that look? Well, users have to generate their keys, the secure boot and TPM PCR policies, and then uh, they have uh, two flows that they can uh, do depending on which part of the process they are. Initially, uh, you probably want to generate, for example, an installer ISO and, uh, um, so that you can proceed to install on the machine. Or alternatively, if you just want to do an upgrade, what is happening is that you create uh, a container image and um, do the upgrade using, for example, our agent in the system. Now, uh, building the U unified system images, we try to provide tooling so that it is as easy as possible. Um, everything starts from a Docker file. You can uh, either base it on our images, but you can also customize it 100% uh, uh, from, from zero. So start with something like from Ubuntu, uh, this version. Uh, on top of that, uh, Kairos will install uh, our binaries and give you a resulting container image. And you can either use that container image, as I said, to do the upgrade or to produce then a bootable image. Uh, the container images can also be used to do, for example, uh, pixie booting in case you want to um, install on multiple machines. There are also other ways to extend the Kairos system in case you might have uh, some images that you want to put across all your devices, but maybe there is one uh, small difference in one of them or so. Uh, one is by using systemd CSX ex extensions, and these ones also need to be signed in the case of um, using trusted boot. And uh, I have an asterisk here because at the moment you can sign them. Uh, we keep the measurements, but um, unfortunately not yet we are doing the validation of that, but it's something that is coming in the future. And the other way of, doing, um, of extending the system is by using what we call Kairos bundles. This uh, basically is just a way to install an application like uh, Nginx to give you an idea where you just point the configuration to one of the bundles that you're interested in having. Uh, how, how do you do that configuration? Well, basically Kairos uses uh, cloud init and uh, you define all your configuration in this YAML file and uh, you can then pass it to the node in multiple ways. It can be via our um, agent in, uh, using the, sorry, our um, Kairos CTL. Um, it can be done via the web interface, so the node, as soon as it uh, comes up, you can uh, look at its IP and put paste the configuration there. Or it can also be remotely because uh, the node will, the first thing it will do is display a QR code. You can uh, take a picture of that QR code and pass it to uh, a, diff a different system that has access to this uh, machine uh, via network and it will configure it for you. Um, one of the other mechanisms uh, that, or features that we offer to try to make this, uh, the experience of the user better is the upgrade, um, doing, uh, sorry, doing AB upgrades. Uh, you probably are um, using a similar system, I don't know, with your phone or uh, one, one of the uh, OSs that you might be using. Uh, just to give you an idea how it works in Kairos is very simple. Like I was saying, we only have an active, passive, and recovery image. If uh, the system is working correctly and you want to do an upgrade, the first step is to take the active image, move it down to passive. The uh, process then will proceed to take the uh, upgraded image and put it into active. If everything goes well, it will reboot the system and you will start with the new uh, upgraded image. If something doesn't go well, then you will boot into the passive image. Uh, if things go really, really badly, then you have the recovery image where you can uh, try to perform uh, some fixes manually. So uh, just to uh, summarize a little bit, uh, what Kairos is trying to do is to give you uh, systems that you can trust, where you know that the uh, operating system that you're going to boot is something that you can trust and that not, no other operating system is going to be booting. 
Uh, it's also providing you with the flexibility to extend or configure the operating system uh, in ways that you might need. And it tries to provide enough features so that your day two operations are as simple as uh, possible. If you follow this QR code there, you will be taken to most uh, to a page in our documentation where you can see uh, more in depth uh, how the trusted boot solution works. Uh, there are obviously some improvements that are coming down the road. Like I mentioned, uh, the measured system DECs ex extensions, we don't want to just keep the measurement there, but validate it, uh, right? Um, we also want to improve the user experience, and we're happy that we have some users that are running it, because then we can go back and forth in things that work and don't work. So if you get to use it, please uh, reach out to us, tell us what uh, could be improved. Um, we also want to provide more flavor support. At the moment, we only offer the trusted boot solution with uh, Ubuntu and with Fedora. Uh, but I was very excited to hear in today's uh, uh, talk uh, about uh, OpenSUSE that they are going to start using systemd boot in the future. So ideally, we're going to also offer that uh, version. And also for the other uh, flavors, uh, we call them flavors, to catch up with the system diversion so that we can provide it uh, across most of the different flavors that we have. And uh, finally, uh, another uh, interesting feature that we would like to have is uh, the remote uh, measurements so that we can do remote at the station uh, and no need to uh, directly, physically uh, invalidate some keys on the system. And that's basically it. If you have any questions, uh, if you have any comments, please uh, let me know. You can visit our Kairos IO documentation page, and I really appreciate you listening. Thanks, Marco, for this talk. First, great talk. Uh, I want to say I'm, I would love to collaborate with Kairos in the future. Uh, I, there's a lot of Linux out there, but Kairos has like a cool flavor to it, you know, and I, it shows. Like you guys do a good job. So here's uh, my my more technical question. So yeah, how big is Kairos? First of all, like you're basically running everything from the init RAMFS always. Yeah. Okay. So, but then my next question is, do you ever? Okay, there is a persistent file system for other data, right? Yeah. Now, do you ever execute code from that file system? Right. Uh, first, the first question was how big Kairos is. Uh, it, it varies depending on the flavor. And uh, what we have, one of the issues we've encountered with some machines is that uh, not only that you have to have a lot of memory to run the system, but also in many cases, loading the system in the UKI firmware, uh, sorry, in the EFI uh, firmware uh, doesn't happen to uh, work because they have very uh, low numbers, like 200 megs or something like that. Uh, I can tell you at the moment, the smallest one we have uh, is the Ubuntu flavor, which is around 300 megs, uh, which might still be a, a lot for some uh, users. And um, the other question, or, or maybe I should say, you might need a much newer device uh, in order to run it. And uh, the other question was about uh, the, um, sorry, can you repeat the yeah, other question? So the other question, right, I mean, so my understanding, right, like you're, you're targeting Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is often a very dynamic workload. I mean, you can run it in a static fashion, it like, yeah. depends, right? But like, where, I mean, assuming, is K3S using container D? I, I don't know. Yeah, like, but presumably you're pulling down containers. Are those yeah. stored in RAM as well, or are they ever spilled to disk? Yeah, so that will depend also on your implementation, as in uh, you, you could uh, put in Kubernetes uh, a storage. Uh, sorry, I'm not very versed in Kubernetes uh, slang, but like a storage device or something like that, and you would uh, uh, be able to save that there. You decide whether you want to encrypt that part or not. Um, and for the most part, if it's on the traditional um, file path of the system, that will be um, immutable. That cannot change. But of course, uh, when it comes to uh, certain areas of the configuration, let's say where uh, K3S needs to uh, 
allow you to to um, specify uh, I don't know like like a slash Etsy uh, something there you can define which of these you want them to be writable and which ones not. Obviously, the more you open up, the more exposed you are going to be. But at least it's your decision how far you want to go there. Okay. My last question, then I'll hand over. So, is Etsy transient by default? Like, you can't write persistent system units? Yeah, you can't. Uh, we have a couple, I would say, I don't know, three, four places that by default we allow to write. In this case, for example, of the uh, K3S, it would be slash Etsy slash, uh, I don't know, Rancher something. Um, but for the most part, we try not to. <laughs> Hi. So you mentioned that the user data, how that is on an encrypted partition and how the the OS is is unencrypted. Yeah. And then you talked about there is an active partition, a passive partition, and a recovery partition. Where is the user data in in those partitions? Is there is there a copy of the user data for the active and the passive? Or correct. So okay. um, so the question is uh, having the different. Uh, um, active, passive, and recovery images, uh, how uh, are you able to access your data across the different uh, images? And yeah, that's correct. What we do is that we have an overlay uh, file system uh, solution there. So whichever you are choosing, it will uh, mount it on, on top and will allow you to have access to your own data. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. I was wondering to learn a little bit more about recovering partition. I mean, like, what exactly it does and what are the cases where we can end up there? What it allow you to do? Did you have any cases where it help you to solve some issues? Yeah. Uh, so the question is about uh, how does the uh, recovery partition kind of fit, I guess, in, in this solution. Uh, basically, it, it's um, kind of a last resource uh, situation where you want to use it. So that means that whenever you're doing upgrades, we don't touch recovery. It's something that you will also have to, uh, on your own, manually um, upgrade little by little. But that allows you uh, to ensure that a certain upgrade that you did is actually performing the way you want it. And then you can do your recovery upgrades. And um, for the most part, in most issues that we've seen, uh, simply going to passive uh, solves the problem. And there in, from passive, you can do the proper uh, upgrade of the active um, uh, image. Uh, but of course, we've uh, been in scenarios where, I don't know, because of a bug that we introduce or whatever, the upgrade is not uh, possible to be done. Thankfully, you can uh, just boot into recovery and just uh, with, with the tooling, for, um, with the Cairo CTL, for example, you can decide what you want to do there, whether you want to do a completely new installation, you can, uh, or, or whether you want to uh, scratch completely the active and, and passive images, keeping your data, of course. Um, that, that's kind of the uh, scenarios that we've normally had to encounter. But for the most part, um, I would say you would want to uh, test your images before you will deploy them to the different uh, nodes because you have to keep in mind, at least in our uh, goal, that a lot of these uh, devices might be out in the field. So you don't want that uh, scenario to ever reach the final customer, so to speak, but that you test it uh, first w within your lab or whatever. Uh, yeah, thanks. I was wondering more about the case, for example, so. Basically, recovery partition actually allows you to access users' data, right? So it also can decrypt them and uh, access them. And yeah. what if attacker, for example, steal our devices during an update procedure and then somehow mess up with update progress and was able to, you know, like access recovery partitions or end up there? Would it, is there any risk there or not? Right. Uh, so what would happen if someone during upgrade uh, tries to um, Change, uh, I don't know, put a rootkit or whatever there to, to um, 
uh, attack your system, uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, in that scenario, that's, that's exactly what the trusted boot mechanism uh, takes place. Because uh, first of all, the system is immutable, so uh, there is no change that they can do uh, on the system images. If they change something uh, on the next uh, reboot, uh, the measurements are going to be uh, validated. If they don't validate, your system is not going to boot, even if it's recovery. Um, and uh, yeah, ba basically, uh, you can rely on the ability of the trusted boot mechanism to not allow either a new operating system, like I was mentioning, or a mo slightly modified uh, system to run there. Of course, if somehow someone gets a hold of the machine while it's running and they would change user data, that would be problematic, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? None? Okay, then let's thank Mauro again for this interesting talk. Thank you very much. And